And we give God glory for his goodness and mercy. That endureth for us. If you got goodness and mercy, you're going to be all right. That's what David said. Your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. I see baby girl out there today. Hi, baby girl. Lauren's back, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Good to see you, sister. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. So many of you are back. Sister Latanya, so good to see you over there in your seat. Amen. God is good all the time. All the time. Yes, he is. We serve a great and awesome God today. Amen, amen. The, uh, Wu the Wu-Tang Clan is absent today. Um, my wife in particular woke up and uh, her vertical kicked in and she's falling all against the walls. And, and I said, you need to sit on down, go back to bed. I want to come home, but you sprawled out on the floor and hit your head somewhere. So uh, I, uh, you know, made some food for her, just told her to stay in the room and get herself together. If you get, got that vertical thing, that's not a good day. And uh, so that's where, where she's at. Her daughters get it from time to time. So it's kind of a hereditary kind of thing, unfortunately. But uh, God, in his goodness and mercy, endure forever. She could have fallen and hit her head and not been at, at the hospital, but she's all right. So we are going to uh, open up our Bibles to the word of God after we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Uh, we don't always understand your ways, but uh, your thoughts are not our thoughts. And neither are your ways our ways. Um, as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are your thoughts from our thoughts and your ways from our ways. It's not even close. And this sometimes causes us to be frustrated. But we, we come to you, Lord, asking you to comfort our hearts and uh, ease our minds and give us a passion to study more about you so that we can understand your ways better in our lives. As the word goes forth today, Lord, may it minister to your people. Um, we all will receive our due portion this day. We're thankful through Jesus our Lord and all of God's children said Amen. Amen. We're going to look at Matthew 27 today. The last few verses. Uh, it's part of the communion narration that we read every Sunday. Uh, Brother Rodney read the Luke account of Jesus being on the cross. Some months ago, I presented a lesson regarding the trials of Jesus, the six trials he had leading up to the cross. Today, we want to deal with some things that occurred when he was on the cross and the application and meaning that it has to us today. God has some phenomenal truths for us this morning. So I, I beseech you to shake off the fatigue and the tired that you might have. Uh, don't blink today, but you can breathe. But don't blink, okay? Uh, these truths that we're going to try to get through in a few minutes are going to be so important to us so that when we Hear the narrations read every Sunday. We have a fuller approach, a fuller account, a better understanding of all those things that were happening while Jesus was on the cross. We often tell you to reflect back on when Christ was on the cross and to think about his life and what he did to give his life a ransom for many. So today we're going to really delve into these four things that are critical. You heard read in your hearing verses 45 through 54. 
We will deal with verses 55 and 56 tonight with a special message to our women. Um, verse 44, verse 45 uh, begins this discourse of Jesus being on the cross. It's the sixth hour, and midnight has come to noon. In other words, it got dark. Six, the sixth hour was 12 noon. The ninth hour was 3 p.m. The third hour was 9 a.m. We're at noon now, and Christ is on the cross. Okay? Now, we're going to start at verse number 51 and deal with these symbols. Um, we all live by symbols. We all live by signs. You have young children that can't read. You give them a tablet. They know enough about signs and symbols to figure out how to play the game. Okay? All right? Uh, without even reading, they just understand. They recognize the most recognized symbol in the world, and that is the golden arches. You drive by golden arches, and you got kids in your car, they're going to try to make you stop, okay? Uh, the, 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 the sign and symbol of Mickey D's attracts children. They have x-ray vision because you're, you're on the freeway, and they can pick out a Mickey D's sign two miles down the road. And you're trying to figure out, why do you see that? Because signs and symbols play a role in our lives, okay? Now, with that backdrop, uh, we got four symbols to try to get through this morning. And we're at Matthew 27 and we will we'll read verse 50 and then we'll get into the symbols in verse number 51. Okay? Verse 50. Everybody there? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit or some versions say he gave up the ghost. Okay? Verse 51, then behold, when you see the word behold, boy, it means pay attention. Because man, what's going to follow it is going to be amazing. So behold, now I got your attention. Now watch what's going to happen. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake, the rocks split, and the graves were opened. So the four symbols are these. The veil of the temple was rent, the earthquake, the rocks split, and the graves were opened. All right? If y'all don't fall asleep, we'll get through all of these. Okay? Now, the veil... The veil in the temple was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide, two inches thick. It took 300 priests to put it up. Okay, that's how big it was. Where are you, Rich? Rich, you here? Come help me. I need to pull this down. It's going to be our veil today. Okay, I step on that chair. I'd be done fell in the baptismal pool. I'm already baptized. Richard, can we get a boy? Hey, 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 there we go. There you go. Bring it on down. It's okay. That's good enough. That's good. Thank you, sir. Gonna stay. That's good enough. Okay. All right. So, the veil was rent. The veil represented three things. Okay. Pay attention now. First thing it it it, it gave uh, acknowledgement to is that God is holy, and you just don't just walk up in His presence just cause you feel like it. Okay. And there was, was, there was a rhyme and reason about how to approach God in his holy temple. The veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. I'm not going to get too technical, but the holy of holies was a little bit off away from the veil. The veil separated the holy of holies from the holy place. The holy place was where the priest prepared the paschal lamb for sacrifice. Okay? And that was done two times a day. 
3 o'clock. That'll be important in a second. Okay? Uh, the Holy of Holies represented the presence of God. His Shekinah glory is that no one can just show up to God without some fear and trepidation. The high priest entered the Holy of Holies to make a sacrifice for himself and for the people. Okay? So the priest would give him a, a bowl of blood from the holy place. He would then take it and be ready to enter the Holy of Holies with the blood sacrifice from the lamb to offer sins for himself and the people. Okay? The altar of incense set outside the veil. The Ark of the Covenant was inside. The mercy seat was where the blood was poured over. And that's as technical as I'll get with you, okay? So, he entered the Holy of Holies with fear and trepidation because he didn't know if he was going to make it out. Not everybody that went in there came out, okay? Because priests, high priests that weren't right with God didn't come out. Hello, somebody. What if God killed preachers that weren't right today? How many folk would be standing up preaching? Somebody say, thank God for grace. Okay. So he wasn't sure if he was going to get out. So he's, scared. He, he's got fear and trepidation. That's serious. Okay? They were so serious about this that when they wrote God's name, Elohim, one of his names to describe who he is, they wrote it some 2,500 times in the Old Testament. And every time they wrote it, Yukon, they got a new writing utensil. They didn't want to defile the name of God by reusing a pen. They didn't have Rite Aid back in the day where you could just go get a 10-pack. When they used his former name, Yahweh, some 6,300 times from Genesis to Malachi, they took a bath every time they wrote it. Somebody say, that's clean. That's how pure they wanted to present themselves. But those who weren't right didn't always make it out. Okay? Now, in Exodus chapter 28, verse 35, it gives specific instructions of how you entered the Holy of Holies. Okay? But something had to occur over a period of time for them to uh, uh, make, some, uh, make, make some concessions or to try to uh, uh, come up with a way to get those guys out of there that didn't make it. Okay? They couldn't leave them there and you couldn't go get them. Because you only went in there how many times a year? And it was called the day of, all right? And it's celebrated on our calendar every October 11th, okay? All right? Jews still call it Yom Kippur, all right? So they would, they would go in, and, and after some, some of these guys didn't make it out. Now, Josephus is the most world-renowned Jewish historian in the history of Jewish law, okay? Nobody has a problem with him, okay? All right? And he says that over a 1,500-year period, about 100 guys went in, and about half of them came out, okay? So what do you do with the guys that don't come out? You can't go get them. So they came up with a custom, and apparently God allowed it to happen a way for them to get the guys out. So everybody that went in, this is what they did. They tied a rope around them, okay, all right? So they went in, all right, and I'm going to come down from the pulpit on it. And they had, the, they had the shawl on them, okay, and they had the bells, all right? The bells were critical to have on, okay? Because when they got in there, Floyd, and if High Priest Pookie didn't make it out, 
Butchie and June both of them had the rope. Okay? And they shake the rope. If they didn't hear the bells going, where my bell? Come on, shake it, shake it. Yeah, they didn't hear the bells, they like, oh snap. <laughs> he ain't make it. So the rope then allowed them to pull him out of there because they couldn't go get him. Is everybody all right? Okay, so that's how that happened over a period of years. Okay, now. For those who were able to make it, glory to God. Now, here's the deal. They were, this was such a serious thing and the respect for God was so awesome. These are the kinds of things that they did. The unfortunate thing today is that people have lost their reverence for God. Okay? And we don't respect God with the awesomeness that we should today. Okay, and that's a problem. We don't take God seriously. Okay, and so they uh, did this kind of thing. Story is told of a little boy who came into the kitchen when his mom was cooking, and he was crying. <laughs> and she said, "What's wrong with you, boy?" He said, "Oh, uh, Daddy was." putting a nail in the wall so he could hang up a picture and he hit his thumb. And she said, he hit his thumb? <laughs> that ain't, what you crying for? That's funny. You should have laughed. And he said, I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> See, because some things ain't funny. Grandma would not kick over her spit can when she was chewing her snuff. And, and we thought it was funny. <laughs> and we wind up laying on the floor looking up at the ceiling like, how did I get down here and what am I looking at the lights for? Because some things aren't funny. My sister said, you're going to learn to respect grandma because if grandma ain't laughing, you don't laugh. Now the Bible talks about this. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, the second beatitude is, blessed are they who mourn, for they should be comforted. I thought it was talking about funerals. No, 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 no. Best of all, they didn't mourn, but they should be coming. It's the second one. Mourning is, we mourn over the things that make God sad. Here's the problem. God is saddened by this world and its sin that it offers. And to some of us, it's funny. Hello. Is not serious enough for us to feel like God might feel. It, it, it tears him apart. It hurts him. And, and, and we don't have that same attitude. And, and, and Jesus says in the beatitude, if you mourn, if you put yourself in the emotionality of God and understand what makes him sad ought to make you sad, what God would cry over when Jesus wept over Jerusalem, then you should be weeping too. That's the kind of attitude you should have. And for those who do that, as in touch with God as close as you can be. And so when you do that, God will comfort you. Okay? When you're sad, and that's, a, that's not a good feeling, but you get comforted through God when you do it, for the things that he would want you to do it for. So that's what that's about. And so we need to get more serious about what is going on. All right? So here's what would happen. We've got, we've got, the, we've got the, 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 the veil down. All right? Now, it would extend about probably from, from the edge of the steps of the pulpit on both sides, 30 feet. All right? And this would be the middle, all right? Now remember, the Bible says the veil was torn in two, so it split down the middle. Prior to the veil being torn, the high priest would have to walk around, Brother Allen, to walk around the veil to get in, and the first thing he would see would be the Holy of Holies. This is the Holy of Holies, y'all, okay? And so he would then make his offering for sin on the mercy seat, which is located on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, 
okay? But when the veil was rent, the very first thing he would see is the Ark of the Covenant. He ain't had to walk around no more. The Ark of the Covenant was right here, and he could offer sin for the people. The veil was rent. But here's what I like about having the veil rent, Lord, if you get Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And Yukon, if you could get Hebrews 4, 13 through 15. And here's what I like about this veil business being rent, and I think you're going to like it too. All right? Hebrews chapter number five. Floyd, you're doing one, five, one, and two. UConn, you're going to do four, verses 14 through 16. Everybody going to follow them, right? Okay, we ready? You're not ready. That's why I use my paper, Floyd. <laughs> you got that phone. That phone turned off on you. That, that's what Rodney called the dumb phone, see? He called a smartphone, and they got the dumb phone, so the phone don't know how to stay on. All right, anyway, all right, catch, catch me on the rebound, Floyd. Catch me on the rebound. You got all right? Okay, here we go. Here is chapter 5, verse 1. I'll read it. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed by men. Get that now. Appointed by men in things pertaining to God that he might offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Talking about the high priest in the Holy of Holies, okay? He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. All right? So he, that's the problem. See, that's the problem right now. Folk who want to go to somebody in a phone booth who got the same problems they have, and then want him to forgive them. But when you con, you in chapter 4, verse 14, what does the Bible say? See, and then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't have to wait once a year to go and get my sins forgiven Amen. no more. See, I can go to the Holy of Holies anytime. I, I, can, I don't have to even be on my knees. I, I don't even have to say anything, Brother Seth. All I got to do is think it, and I'm in contact with God. And this is 24-7. Prior, I had to wait till October 11th for the priest to go in and hook a brother up. But I ain't got to worry about that now, see. I, 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 can do, I can do that with God sitting in my cubicle at work, all right? I can be driving down the street in my car, and I can touch God because he knows how to touch me. I don't need no man in a phone booth trying to tell me that I'm forgiven. Not anymore. Yes, God. And when you get to chapter number 10, see the high priest, he had to get out of there. The longer he stayed, the more chance he was taking on not getting out of there. Chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says, but this man Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, ain't got to keep going every year and year now, every sacrifice for sin forever, Offered it one time forever. What did he do? He sat down on the right hand of God. See, the high priest couldn't take no seat. But see, Jesus can sit on down. Help me, somebody. He can sit on down. Right. And he ain't going nowhere. He ain't in no hurry. Man. High priest had to get out of there. Right. You ain't got no time to be standing in the presence of God, Mr. High Priest. But Jesus sits down. And he ain't in no hurry to leave. So I can go to him anytime. And so can you. So God, let me set this up here. I can go boldly anytime I want to. Through his throne comes the veil been rent, y'all. That's why that's important. You've been reading that for years, and, and now you're the veil rent, see. Now I can do that. Prior to that, it was a problem. 
Okay? All right, let's move on so I can get through this. Back to Matthew. Back to Matthew. Back to Matthew 27. Back to Matthew 27. Don't, you know, when I, if I go to some other scriptures, just hold yourself in Matthew, okay? Bookmark it. You know, put an offering envelope or something in it. Okay, here we go. So we know about the veil now. And the earth quake. Now what is that about? Okay. Two key components. And they both have to do with the giving of the law. Okay, so I got to keep, keep, you, keep you woke now. Stay, stay with me. All right. <laughs> Exodus. We can find that one. Genesis, Exodus. We got it. <laughs> 32. I'm going to read verses 19, 26, and 28. And Exodus. This has to do with the giving of the law. We're in Mount Sinai area. Okay? All right? Exodus 32, 19. So it was as soon as Moses came near to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. Remember, they, Moses went to get the law, and they, and they went to act a fool and paying attention to Aaron, and went crazy. Okay? Build a golden calf. All right? All right? Moses' anger became hot. And he cast down the tablets, okay, out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Okay, now let's go to verse number 26. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Right. Drop down to verse 28. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. However, about 3,000 men of the people failed that day. What is the significance of that? 3,000 died at the giving of the law. Okay? Stay with me now. 3,000 died at the giving of the law. The law kills because you can't keep it. Right, right. Okay? 3,000 died when the law was given. 3,000 got saved when the Holy Spirit was given. Amen. See the significance? Connect the dots. Okay? Law kills, grace saves. Okay, somebody say, thank God for grace. Okay, all right. What if God killed thousands of people like he did on this day when they disobeyed him? Hello. How many of us will be sitting here today? 3,000 died for not keeping it all. 3,000 got saved when the Holy Spirit was given. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. Grace saves us. The law was destined to kill us. 3,000 died when it was given. 3,000 were saved when grace instituted. Is that all right? Okay. Right? So, that is one of the truths. The Bible says, for grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That, not that of your, yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Amen. Right? Now, people died. All right? And the second thing that happened about this quake business appears in Exodus chapter 19. All right? Now, turn back a few pages to Exodus 19, verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly. That's significant. Okay? Haggai, I know y'all call him Haggai, but it's Haggai was 
we talked about this as well. I'm going to read it to you, verses 5 and 7 through 7. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. Okay, he's reflecting back on that time. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once, once more, in a little while, I will shake and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations that they shall come to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Notice he's doing some shaking, a whole lot of shaking going on now, y'all. Okay? And why is that significant? Hebrews 12, 25 talks about the same thing happening. Here's what's going on. When Moses is given the law, we now move from patriarchal dispensation to the Mosaic dispensation. Okay? So, whenever there was a change in dispensations, God caused the earth to shake. He, he's moving the people from patriarch the promise that he dealt with the people with. He gave them promises. Let's look at Abraham's life, all the promises he's got. And now Mo Mo Moses is now received the law, the commandments. We now move to Mosaic dispensation. Okay? Now parallel it back to Matthew. Parallel it back to Matthew. When the earth quake, what's the significance of that? We are now moving from Mosaic dispensation to Christian dispensation, and so the earth quaked. Notice, through the, each of the dispensations, there was a quaking and a shaking of the earth. Thereby, when Christ died on the cross, it brought in the New Testament or the Christian dispensation. Hey. How do we know? Because the earth quaked. Hey. It quaked coming out of patriarchal into Moses. And it quaked coming out of Mosaic into Christian. That's why the earth quaked. Hey. So we understand better now what's going on here. So when Floyd next week is reading about the earthquake, we understand, ah, I know, that's what's going on now. The earthquake, because this was a sign, remember we're talking about signs and symbols, of a new dispensation being ushered in. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So, that's our earthquaking, y'all. Now, so when we move from that, the rock split. See, creation has never had a problem with Jesus. She never had a problem with it. Cooperate with Jesus all the time. Okay? Waters, atoms would formulate and part. God's people walk through on dry land. Winds of the waves obey him. Fish obeyed him when you look at Jonah. Right. The gourd obeyed him. Book of Jonah. The only problem God has had is men not obeying. Man. That's the problem. Nature's never had a problem. So these big old rocks all over the are all over the earth at this time are opening up out of respect and awe to Christ. So when these rocks split, because that's what creation does. It loves our Lord. And so should we. Uh, I'll move on from that. I think we've got a little bit of what's going on. Now, I need to spend some time on this last one. And the graves were open. Many bodies of the saints 
which had fallen asleep, were raised. Got some resurrection going on. Okay? That was going to happen after Jesus resurrected. Why resurrection? What is this about? What is going on here? Okay? Now they are, if you trace the, 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 the relationship that God has had with his leaders, and I'll give you a few of them, resurrection becomes critical. Elijah raised the, 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 the boy who, uh, uh, the widow of Zarephath's mother, a son. And 1 Kings 17, verse 17 and following. Then Elisha did the same thing to the Shunammite woman, Yukon, in right. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 18 and following. Okay? He used his resurrection to show who his leaders really, really are. The best one I could find, though, is in the book of Numbers. Anybody ever heard of Kyra, Kyra, Dathan, and Abinah? Anybody ever heard of them guys? Okay, so let's look at Numbers 16. You can find Numbers. Just a little bit because Numbers, you can get that one. Okay? Uh, numbers 16. Okay? Start at verse 1. Let's read a couple of them so you know what the gist of this is going on here. Numbers 16.1, Nicara, the son of Izar, the son of Ketha, the son of Levi. Now our next character, Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. All right? So what's going on? Verse 2, and they rose up. When somebody rise up, that's a problem. Okay? Because they, they're creating a rebellion. Okay? All right. It rose up, rose up before Moses and some of the children. When people rise up, they're going to bring some people with them. Brother Carl, they ain't coming by themselves. They're coming to get you and take you down. And they're going to they're gonna get as many folk as they can. And it is what's going on. And it, all right? And it's some 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. These are heavy brothers. Sometimes you think because you got a nice little title, that means you entitled for some things in the church. I don't care if you're a doctor, PhD, you got 1,500 of them, you still are serving on the Lord. All right? Now, here they come. Here they come. All right? Now, verse 3. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, watch this. You take too, take too much upon yourself. And all the congregation is holy. Every one of them. And the Lord is among you, among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? We got some haters in the house. Okay? All right? And so now, they, they want to they, they run a coup on Moses and Aaron. Okay? And they want to take over now, Marquise. They want to take over. Okay? So that's where we at. So Aaron and Moses goes to the Lord and says, what do we do about these characters? Right? So in chapter 17, all right, here's what happens. Turn over one chapter. And he tells them we're in Numbers 17. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, okay, so here's what he did. All right? So told him to Approach the children of Israel, get from them a rod of each of the father's house, okay? And have Corb, Dathan, and Abinam get their rod, okay? And he's in verse 5, and it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the com complaints of the children of Israel which they make against you. So what he says is, I tell you what, tell them jokers to get their rod, and you get yours. And I always wondered what the, what, the, what the budding of the rod was all about until I started looking at this, okay? So here we go. God says, hmm, have them throw down their rod, and you put yours down too. Now verse 5 tells us what's going to happen. Now it came to pass on that day 
that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. So here is the deal. Remember I talked to you about resurrection a minute ago? Check this out. You got two sticks on the ground. And God puts life in Aaron's rock. Something that's dead that gets life is no longer dead anymore because it has been as a sign of resurrection because a dead stick is a dead stick until some life is put in it. So Aaron's rod budded is a symbol of resurrection because it was a dead stick before God put the bars on it. So God's leaders were chosen with the sign of resurrection. And Aaron's rod is a part of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? All right? So, what is this resurrection about then here when Jesus died? It is sharing, showing to people, look, the ultimate leader, the man who has been given all the power and authority in heaven and earth is my leader. And he's resurrected. He will be resurrected and the people who died in the Lord will be raised too. So this sign of resurrection proves that Jesus is my choice as a leader for his people. Man. That's what the resurrection business is all about. Yes. Okay. So we're running around, people are, and these people, if you look, read the other accounts, the folk recognized who these people were. That's right. They're called Butchie. I thought Butchie was dead. <laughs> hey, over there. Because validated Christ as God's leader. Now, we'll talk about the centurion tonight. Okay? But, here is the deal. The proof of this, I'm, I'm going to need y'all to read this time. Floor, your phone ready? It's ready. Okay. All right, I'll go to you second. You kind of go to you first. Romans 1.4. You're going to see how all of the Godhead is connected in the resurrection of Christ. So, Floyd, you're going to go to John 2, 19. Okay? And then I'll do Galatians 1, 1. First of all, Romans chapter 1, verse number 4. Romans 1, 4. Then we're going to go to John, Gospel of John 2.19. Then we're going to go to Galatians 1.1. 1, 1, and then we'll be ready to, ready to wrap this up. Romans 1.4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so the spirit of holiness is God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so his role in playing, played in the resurrection of Christ is shown here. Okay, Bible makes that clear. You there, uh, Brother Floyd, in John chapter 2, verse 19? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Okay, who's talking? And he says, you kill me, that's all right. But in three days, I'm going to raise it up. So now, the Holy Spirit's role, we just saw in Romans 1, 4, Christ's role in his own resurrection is shown here in John 2, 19. He said, I'm going to raise it. So we got two of the three. So when we look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, and let's find out how God the Father's 
connection to this resurrection is. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, are you there? Yes. You're not yet? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, all right. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ. And God the Father, what did he do? Peace. Who raised him from the dead. So we have this connection now. Now you understand this resurrection business. Man. Okay? The Godhead connects in all of this to prove that Jesus is God's lead. Now, in Romans 1, 4, that word is horizo. We get the word horizon. Jesus is horizon over everything. I know that ain't good English, but you understand. He's, a, he's risen over everything. All power is in his hand. So, this is what is going on. See, the dead rising, rising from the dead proves that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. The dead rising up proves what Jesus said, I am he who was once dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Revelations 1 and 18. Amen. The dead rising up proves that Jesus has the keys to the death, hell, Amen. and the grave. That's why this resurrection business is so important in this text. Now, and that's why he's a great high priest. Amen. As we get ready to close, we look at verse number 54. Now, I'll talk more about the centurion tonight and a special message for the women. Okay? Come back if you can. Please. The centurion and his boys are seeing all this stuff come, come about. Now, they were the guards for Jesus. They've been with Jesus all this whole weekend. Okay? And there's about a hundred of them. How do I know? Centurion is where we get the word century from. And century means what? A hundred. So he had about that many with him. And they're escorting Jesus. These are the same guys that spit on him, beat him did all of this stuff to torture him. These are the same guys. These are the same guys who mocked him. They'd be the son of God come down from the cross. Hmm. These are the same guys that put their thorn the crown of thorns on his head. All these guys, these are the same people. Now they're standing at the foot of the cross. And the veil rent. At 12 o'clock for the next three hours, it was dark like midnight. Rocks split. Graves going to open up. And they get to see all this now. Then in verse number 54. So when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, right. saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Amen. All of that stuff came to fruition to them, and they could see all this stuff happening and realize they had made a mistake. Luke says they began to glorify God. Okay? Luke 23, 47. That stuff changed me. So here's the question. When you talk about Jesus, do people change their minds? And, and those who would mock Jesus and not take him seriously, after you get through talking to him, after you get through witnessing to him, after you get through living your life before them, do they now think like the satirian says, why? He is the Son of God. Hmm. Do those people have that reaction because of you? Man, 
I'm slowing down because I just want this to marinate. I, 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 you know, but I'm about to sit down. Okay, that's what's that's what has to happen. Okay, that's how we transform the lives of people for how we live and what we say about our Lord. So people will say, oh, I want some of that. I want to be where you're at. I want to do what is good. Help me, help me, help me, help me to know what must I do to be saved. Okay? So is there anybody here today who's not a Christian? Maybe you've been studying with some people, and, and, and maybe right now you've heard enough to say, wow, like the centurion. They were amazed, and they feared greatly. I've heard enough. I have seen enough. I'm ready to be a Christian today. Anybody here like that? There's enough that was going on today in the text to let you know that Jesus is the Christ, Amen. the Son of the living God. Don't walk out of here not obeying his gospel. Amen. Heard enough of the word. Do you believe the word? What a great lesson we have today to what God has shown us. Have faith in what you have heard. To ready to, to change your mind, change your life like the satirian did. Because they didn't believe that he was the Christ until they saw it. And maybe you as a non-Christian today, today now you see. Now is your turn. Make the confession Amen. that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It brought death to him and it will bring life to you. You live faithful unto death and be buried in the watery grave of baptism to become a Christian today. Amen. Don't walk out of here if you're not a Christian. Nope. You've heard too much, know too much now to walk out of here and deny the Lord before his word. Amen. Time to make the choice. I don't care how young you are, I don't care how old you are, it's the, today is the day of salvation for you. believe his word and you want to live your life for Christ. You're subject to the invitation.